So this is <coughs> from the archives, from Warner's archives, and this is a speech called A History of the Suffrage, and this is written in 1914. So it's before women have the right to vote in this country. So he is supporting that movement. Uh, <coughs> and this is a very interesting essay because what he does is start with like the whole history of the right to vote, beginning I think with like Sparta, okay, Sparta, Greece. And he goes into Rome and then he goes into England and then he goes into the United States and finally he gets to women. But what he, this is, a, this is on your handout also, <coughs> what he does is remind us of the sort of class battle also around suffrage. It wasn't just men and women. Having thus shown the gradual extension of the suffrage from the nobles and barons and property owners to include all adult males, that was the first step, the next and final move is the granting of the right to vote to women. So that's E.C. Warner writing that. And <coughs> amongst his suffrage correspondence, you do have uh, these letters. This is from Alice Paul, 1913, if you know the, the story. Uh, so there's resources there. Uh, so <laughs> it's a big story, as I mentioned, and I think this image may help to sort of organize in your head the sort of relationship here. Remember that... Um, it's really May Wright Seawall and her organizing and putting a framework in place that's helping the suffrage movement as well as the peace movement. Uh, and Warner is sort of coming into that. And I like the idea of a confluence, a sort of meeting of paths and a sort of merging around these issues, peace and suffrage of both lives. Um, that's E.C. Warner and, and May Wright Seawall. So, this quote, I have, and education here, because this gets into what happened to the American School Peace League. Worldwide events not only affect personal destinies of people, but they affect institutions, and in this country, they affected education, okay? Uh, they affected public education. And I'm talking about World War I, that event in particular, affected public education and affected our own understanding of our own history. Um, and what happened? So this is 1913 to 1914 yearbook. It's called the American School Peace League in these years. But after we become involved in the war, um, the name is changed to the American School Citizenship League. The word peace is erased, is taken out. Furthermore, if you look at the symbols, you can see that the American School Peace League has the word peace and has like a little book there, okay? But what we have with the American School Citizenship League is no book, no word of peace, just these sort of scales. Okay. This is a kind of dark chapter, actually. Um, <coughs> and those of us who are philosophers, and there are some of us here, uh, Bertrand Russell, you may know, is a very important philosopher. And uh, this is a case uh, where Bertrand Russell opposed World War I openly. He was at Cambridge at the time, and he published a pamphlet saying we should not be at war, and he was a supporter of conscientious objection. And so you can see that this is printed by the no, no Conscription Fellowship, an organization of conscientious objectors. And because Bertrand Russell had authored a pamphlet opposing the war, he's a Cambridge professor. He's famous, okay? He, uh, first of all, loses his lectureship at Trinity College, and he's fined, and then he eventually goes to jail. So this is happening in England in 1916, okay? We're not, the United States is not in the war yet, but this is how 
England is treating people who are opposing publicly the war and very famous professors. Uh, so that's Bertrand Russell. And um, the law at the time called the Defense of the Realm Act, it's printed on your handout, it says no person shall in writing or in any circular or other printed publication make statements likely to prejudice the recruiting and discipline of His Majesty's forces. So you just can't say anything that would weaken the militarism spirit uh, and the war effort. So you can go read it, be an autodidact, okay? Uh, so 1916. This is in Warner's archives. And I didn't know what this was. Okay. This is one of the pieces that has been scanned in into Europeana. So if you go onto that link and you want to read this, and it's a good read, okay, it's there online for you. I didn't know what this was. This is um, a superintendent in New York writing to Warner. Warner has asked for a letter of Hyman Herman, a pupil in the DeWitt Clinton High School, uh, so here it is, here's his letter. This letter was a homework assignment. And the assignment was to sort of write a letter to President Wilson about what you think, uh, what you think about his decision to go into the war. That was the homework assignment. And little Hyman Herman was a 16 year old and he writes a sort of scathing, I mean, I think he might have had help from his parents. <laughs> but uh, here, here's one of the passages, this is on your handout. How is it that the US, a country far from democratic <coughs> and, and daily proving itself to be such, and England, the imperial and selfish, and we exclude all minor participants, how is it that we undertake to slam democracy upon a nation whether it likes it or not? That's little Hyman Herman, okay. Um, what unparalleled audacity to attempt to force 70 million people to adopt a certain kind of government. It's so prescient, isn't it? Okay, anyway, there it is from a high schooler. Um, <coughs> So what happens? And why does Warner have this in his archives? And again, you can get this on your piano. So I just follow, I was like, wanted to know what this was and who he is. And that led me to this. The trial of the three suspended teachers of DeWitt Clinton High School. So we're talking Bertrand Russell, but with public school teachers. Uh, <coughs> And so this is in 1917, okay, November 22nd. Samuel, and there's three defendants, Thomas Mufson, Henry Schneer, and Samuel D. Schmalhausen, okay. Uh, can't make it up. And Samuel D. Schmalhausen was the teacher of little Hyman Herman, okay. And he assigned that, write a letter to President Wilson. And <coughs> I don't know what these other two did. I've just been sort of studying Hyman and his teacher. And they were put on trial and uh, they were dismissed. Uh, earlier that year, they had published in the New Republic an article called The Religion of Free Men. This is on your handout as well. Uh, <coughs> it is not too extreme to assert that in wartime, as in peacetime, some of the most heroic deeds are performed by those who do not, and if called upon, would not take up arms in defense of the cause. There are other forms of bravery than the purely military one. So they are, these are men, and they are arguing for a different conception of courage and bravery. And um, these are the three, there were other actually uh, authors of this statement and you can, it's online, you can go Google it. Uh, and another gem, the test of manhood lies in service, not in one particular kind of service, 
suitable to one particular type of mind and body, but genuine service genuinely rendered to humanity. Okay, so it's a kind of like Bertha von Suttner, you know, there's like there should be a humanization of statecraft, and this is one way of humanely serving the state. It's not just giving your body over to be killed, this kind of thing. Um, but interestingly, it was signed, uh, conscientious objectors and their champions. They were supporters of conscientious objectors, uh, the three teachers who were put on trial and fired. And shortly after this, um, uh, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, this is Warner sort of saying a, a sort of thing that counters <laughs> the conscientious objector statement. He says, our boys must be taught that the defense of their country may become their first duty and that when it does, only a coward will shirk this duty. So he's adopting a different conception of courage than the conscientious objectors. Um, he's talking about the virtue of courage. Uh, but one thing I wanted to mention that shortly after this happens, uh, it's on your handout, I don't, I don't think I have a slide on it, but the United States enacts the uh, Anti-Sedition Act in 1918, which effect makes it a crime to say anything negative against the war. So any kind of um, peace movement people, and there were like 2,000 prosecutions. You may have heard of Eugene Debs. He was an opponent of the war. He was arrested and put in jail. So this is a kind of dark chapter in our history, and we're really following um, England's lead in doing this and sort of making criminal any kind of critique of the war and any kind of endorsement of a different conception of courage. Okay? So that does happen. Um, and E.C. Warner says this. He is talking about <coughs> the virtue of courage here. And uh, we're getting to the end uh, because this is the last quote on your handout. And this is from uh, a speech, Women and Patriotism, that she gives in 1895. And it's so very interesting. It's long, but stay with it, please. So long the ideal of physical courage has been recognized in a willingness to meet death, and the highest ideal of moral courage has been associated with willingness to meet death for a good and noble cause. And I, this distinction between physical and moral courage, very interesting. The Greeks make it, and I think it's because of her reading of the classics she knows about this. Um, so it, because of these associations, it has grown a difficult task to make people realize that it requires more physical courage to live three score, that means 60 years, a score is 20 years. It requires more physical courage to live 60 years and 10, so 70 years, than to die at an earlier date. And that it requires more moral courage to come up to four score years by reason of strength, which has been devoted to the illustration as well as to the advocacy of high moral ideals than to die for any however noble cause. So it's long, but what she's saying is our imagination about physical courage and moral courage is dominated by a kind of military understanding of them. But in fact, she says, it requires more physical courage and more moral courage to live a life of active service for, like serving your, serving your country in a constructive way, like for a cause. I think she's probably thinking of someone like Susan B. Anthony. That it requires more courage to live that kind of life and go up in front of audiences and have eggs thrown at you, because that's what happened to her, and just like keep going. Like that it's like harder to do that than to risk your life you know, for you know, a few weeks and then get killed when you're 18. To live your life like that is what real courage is, she's saying. And that's a totally different conception of courage. Um, and so she is talking about the virtues of physical courage and moral courage. She's making this distinction, which does have its roots in ancient Greek philosophy, actually. 